If you are like me, you've probably seen these kind of videos before. There is something very satisfying about physics simulations. So, while I was scrolling through TikTok, I thought to myself, that looks easy. I can make that. This is a triangle. Triangles are the building blocks of everything we'll create. Rendering one is as simple as writing these three lines of code. With them, we can build much more complex shapes and geometries. Like this cube, for example. Though, it is looking kind of flat. We'll add some light to fix it. Much better. But here's where our problems start. We can draw 1, 10, or even 100 cubes. No problem. But if we increase that number up to, say, 1000, the performance drops, significantly. Up until now, we've been using the CPU to draw all of our objects. We can think of the CPU like a master painter, say Bob Ross, for example. Bob Ross is precise, skilled, and can draw basically any painting we want. Thanks, Bob! But if the painting gets too complex, even Bob himself needs time to finish it. Now, let's imagine the graphics card not as a single painter, but as loads of them instead. They are not as skilled as Bob, though. They're more like students. So, instead of having Bob draw the whole scene, we give each of these painters a very simple task. Just paint one triangle. Then, we take all of those triangles and piece them together. Because we have so many painters working in parallel, we get the full image way faster than Bob could ever do it on his own. With this approach, we're no longer limited to just a thousand objects, but we can render 10,000, 100,000, or even a million objects, all thanks to the graphics card. And Bob. Thanks, Bob. The first step to implement physics is to get our objects moving. If we know their velocity and position, we can calculate the new location every frame. We can apply the same idea for rotation, by factoring in orientation and angular velocity. We could update each object one by one, but that'll take forever. Instead, just like before, we'll let the GPU handle everything in parallel. In this simple shader, we take in the position, rotation, and both linear and angular velocities of all of our objects. Each thread is then assigned to update a specific object. So, we grab that object's properties, and from there, it's just a matter of updating the values. And just like that, our objects are no longer static, but they can move. Pretty cool, right? Now we have dynamic objects. But if we want to simulate collisions, we still got a long way to go. All right, let's talk about collisions. This is where things get really interesting and also a bit more complex, so pay attention. Imagine a scene filled with squares. How would you find out which ones are colliding and which ones are not? At a first glance, we can rule out some collisions pretty much immediately. Take these two, for example. They're so far apart that there's clearly no chance of them intersecting. This idea of quickly eliminating obvious non-collisions is extremely important. This is what we call the broad phase of collision detection. There are incredibly efficient and very complex algorithms designed to handle this kind of problem. But I'm trying to keep things simple. So instead, I'll be using bounding spheres. The idea is very intuitive. We surround each object with a sphere, just large enough to contain it. And the beauty of spheres is that collision checks are really easy to handle. We first need to calculate the distance separating both objects. And we know if they are colliding, if this distance is smaller than the sum of the radii. If it's larger, then they're not colliding. With this approach, checking all possible pairs one after another becomes unreasonable. So instead, we do it in parallel, launching one thread per object. It's like unraveling a giant for loop and letting thousands of threads handle the work all at once. Now, remember, this phase is meant to quickly eliminate obvious non-collisions. But it's not 100% accurate, so we'll get some false positives. That's why every potential collision, both the false and true positives, move on to the next step, the narrow phase. To understand the narrow phase, let's go back into 3D. Can you tell if these two objects are colliding? And what about now? And what about now? <laughs> 
It turns out they are not colliding, it only looked like it from the original angle. What we just did is find something called a separating axis. This is the core idea behind the separating axis theorem, or SAT. It says that if you can find at least one axis along which two convex objects don't overlap, then they're definitely not colliding. So, in practice, we project both objects onto several axes and check if their projections overlap. If we find an axis where there is no overlap, we can safely say that they are not colliding. But if they do overlap on every axis, then we get a collision. Now the question is, how many axes do we actually need to check? This is where 2D and 3D are a bit different. In 2D it's relatively simple. We just check the normals of all of the edges from both objects. But in 3D we need to check all the face normals from both objects, plus the cross product of every pair of edges, one from each object. As you can imagine, this makes SAT much more computationally expensive than something like bounding spheres. Now it's time to check if our code actually works. Wait, that's probably way too many objects. Let me lower the number a bit. A few moments later. Alright, now it looks like things are running smoothly. Let's run the simulation and see what happens. If you feel like nothing's happening, you're absolutely right. Remember, we're only detecting collisions, but we aren't doing anything with them. We now need a way to actually see which objects are colliding. For that, instead of coloring our objects randomly, we'll make them all grey by default. Then, if an object is colliding with anything else, we'll paint it red. That way we can clearly tell what's in contact and what's not. Ok, let's run the simulation again. And honestly, I think this is looking pretty good. Didn't expect it to look this cinematic though. As you can see, we're getting some very precise collision detection. And most importantly, even though we reduce the number of objects on the screen, we still have tens of thousands of them. Which means we can already simulate some pretty complex scenarios. From this point on, it's just a matter of resolving those collisions. And for that, we're heading back to the diagrams. Ok, so right now, each object has a velocity assigned to it. But when two of them collide, we don't actually do anything about it. So they just pass right through each other. A rather naive solution is just to invert their velocities when they collide. And, as you can see, even this basic approach gives us a much more convincing result. But there's a catch. If the objects are moving at an angle, rather than perfectly straight, this trick falls apart, and the collisions behave not as we would expect. A better approach is to use a collision normal. This is a vector that points in the direction of the collision. We first calculate how fast are both objects moving relative to each other. Then, take how much of this velocity is useful in the collision. With this, we already get much more accurate collisions. But this approach is not perfect. It still doesn't take mass into consideration. So it doesn't matter if one of our objects is, say, four times heavier than the other, they will both bounce off with the same speed. We have to do better. Let's look at this problem from a slightly different angle. Instead of trying to reflect the velocities, what if we figure out how much these velocities should change as a result of the collision? We'll call that change delta v. To calculate it, we introduce an impulse. An impulse is basically a sudden burst of force applied in an instant. Now, here's the key part. We use this impulse to calculate each object's delta v, which will change depending on both objects' masses. And finally, we apply those changes. If we now run the simulation, you can see that there's one more thing we need to fix. With the current setup, our objects collide and get stuck together, as if they were made of clay. That's because we're missing one last ingredient, restitution. Restitution is a value that controls how bouncy a collision is. It usually goes from 0 to 1. 0 meaning no bounce at all, 1 meaning objects bounce off with full energy. To apply this, we simply add this factor to the equation. The rest of the calculation stays exactly the same. With just this small change, our objects can bounce once again. Now, in theory, we could make this solver as complex as we want. So, to avoid blasting you with even more information, most of which I barely understand myself, just know that after some research, I ended up with these two shaders. It may look a bit intimidating, but believe it or not, this is still a very basic solver. It doesn't even take into account things like angular velocity. But hey, I think this is good enough for now. I'll maybe revisit this project in the future. Now we can finally enjoy some nice visuals. Finally, there's one test I haven't tried yet, simulating thousands of objects. So as a final challenge, here are 5,000 objects falling onto the ground. I don't see a way this could go wrong. <laughs>
Oh, shit.